أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أستغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين سنوات <تصفيق> ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سلوات السلام عليكم my dear elders uh, brothers and sisters nice to see all of you uh, mashallah my days are getting busier because of your warmth and Hospitality, uh, I'm suffering from burger lag. Uh, Murtaza and Shalina would know what that is. Who, mashallah, Allah bless them, took us out. So I went to Aussie's, had the, had the burger. So I am still feeling the effects. So I got over the jet lag and now, today I'm being honest, I feel a bit, you know. So, but inshallah, it will help in some way. Um, and, uh, you know, very beautiful city anyway, mashallah. Um, so as, as promised, uh, the next two nights, I'm trying to, as much as I can, delve into the ethical dimensions of our beloved Prophet and Al Hussein ibn Ali, alayhi wasalam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Hamad. And I understand that a number of you, you know, have questions about how we categorize uh, their judgments and choices. Do we say good judgment, bad judgment? Do we say sin? Do we say mistake? Do we say negligence? But I want to go logically, right? So I'm going logically in the order of the verses and the tafsir, because that's the way the Quran is setting up. So I know you have these burning things of how to understand. I, I promise to you that I am going to deal with that. But I want to finish off the point I made yesterday, where we concluded that our beloved Prophet, as an example, is making moral judgments and ethical choices throughout his life, even before wahi, which is affecting and developing his ethical nature. What we discussed was at-tab'ul muqtasab, the acquired nature, the khuluq in adim, we said is something innate in the verse and something that you acquire. And the Prophet is no different. And so the Prophet at the time that he is in Medina, he is developing that trait of governance, right? So when a number of non-Muslim authors refer to him as a statesman, they're referring to that period in which he was a governor of Medina, in which he was involved in the Sahifatul Medina, the charter of Medina, which if you have read it, by the way, I would recommend you to read it, a very beautiful charter in which you see the theory of Islam or the principles of the Quran in application in society. The Prophet openly respects the rights of Jews, of Christians and different tribes and acknowledges the diversity of society and says that this is the Ummatun Wahida or the, the, the one nation, right? Now, today, when we say Ummah, what do we refer to? Muslims, right? Our Ummah is Canadian society, or my Ummah is British society. Or maybe we can extend it and say it's a global Ummah today, right? And this is a concept that maybe needs to be revisited, that with globalization and technology, when there is injustice in one part of the world, do we have a duty to respond? Right now, maybe the easy answer is yes, but I also think uh, that it becomes very stressful and psychologically difficult. You know, you get so many things in your inbox, people, you know, charities saying, give money here for this well. Uh, there's an issue in Palestine, there's an issue in Yemen. So what do you do? I, I, we don't have practical guidance there of how to behave, right? So we do need a review on one, what is our ummah? And when something happens in our ummah, what is, what is the extent of our duty to behave, right? Because Imam al-Islam has always said that, you know, if you cannot, for example, 
first you say something with your tongue, right? And if you can't say something with your tongue, you use your hand, if not your limbs. Then we have a hadith like this, which demonstrate that Imam al-Islam responded to situations of oppression or injustice or need. So this example that I'm giving you is to show that the Prophet was able to apply the principles of the Quran into a realistic society in order to govern that society, right? Now, today, as maybe I've told a few of you, my work with asylum seekers is that I have yet to see a truly Islamic country. You know, I have probably read maybe 150 witness statements by Muslim asylum seekers from probably majority of Muslim countries throughout the last three, four years. Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, parts of Nigeria, for example, everywhere, Malaysia. And if, the, the majority argument by asylum seekers, by the way, is that either they are escaping from their own government because the government is not giving them political expression, like in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood is being persecuted, or in Saudi Arabia, minorities are being persecuted, so they have, a, they have an issue, right? Or in Iraq, there is sectarian violence, right? So most Muslim asylum seekers are fleeing from their own Muslim government. What does that tell you about the state of Islam today, right? So, I mean, I, I have not, uh, my humble view is Britain or Canada are maybe more Islamic than Islamic countries. And I'm connecting back to Sahifat al Madina because they realized one very important thing, the rule of law and the concept of one nation, that everybody is subjected to these rights. One must respect diversity. And three, one must operate on that sense of justice. This is how Rasulullah, peace upon him, operated. And it's something, it appears to me, based on my legal research and experiential evidence and dealing with asylum seekers, that is what we lack. So the first point I want to make is that when we think about the Prophet developing his ethical ability, we also have to think that these choices led to a transformation or a transition from this wahi, this metaphysical realm, which came down and then transformed society practically. That is our humble, humble duty. This is my humble aim in these lectures. How is Surah Al-Qalam, how is the Quran relevant not just for our metaphysical and spiritual understanding, but uh, practical reform, inshallah, salawat. <laughs> The second thing, uh, you know, and I'm, I, by the way, every day I'm sort of changing bits of my lectures based on your questions, okay? The, the second thing that, that some of you asked in public as well was how does this relationship work uh, whereby if Allah is instructing the Prophet to do something, then does that mean Allah is uh, designating the Prophet and making the choice that he is the Prophet? And the Prophet just has to obey, that's it. Or is it that from before in the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows that this person is going to become Prophet, but yet naturally there is the free will of the Prophet to act and develop himself, right? How do we reconcile these notions of the mind of Allah, where Allah knows everything, the free will of Rasulullah, and three, if he is to become this prophet, right, then the choice that he makes, how does Allah respond in that situation? And if he made a different choice, what would be Allah's response? These are, if, if I'm correct, you asked a number of these questions. Have I summarized? Yes? Okay. Now, in these lectures, I'm using several tafasir, and I've been open about my sources, okay? I've used... Majmul Bayan, Allama Tabrisi, Tafsiru Safi, Al Mizan, Allama Tabatabai, a bit of Tafsiru Kumi, Tafsiru, Tafsiru Nemune, Ayatollah Nasir Makarim Shirazi, several Sunni Tafsir as well I've used, all right? One Tafsir that I think I'm using for first time in this lecture is the Tafsir of Ibn Arabi. Okay, very beautiful Tafsir, okay, and it is a mystical Tafsir, 
right? So, so each tafsir is going to give you a different perspective of how to look at these verses, right? And if you remember the example I gave yesterday, khuluk in adim can be interpreted in two ways. You can say it's the religion of Islam, and you say Prophet now had this religion of Islam, and any other type of religion is wrong, and then you have sometimes a very extreme understanding of Islam. Or you say khuluk in adim is relation to his character, right? Now look at Ibn Arabi's understanding of the Prophet's character and choices in relation to Allah. So I've translated four lines. Now this is his uh, tafsir of verse 4. Inna ka la'ala khulikin adim. Indeed you are on a mighty disposition or mighty character. He says, your reality, that is the Prophet's reality, is created with the morals of God. Okay, that is tab'ul gharizi. That's your innate nature. We all have morals, no problem. Okay. But look at now the change here. Your reality is created with the morals of God who assists you with holy assistance. Ruhul Qudus. See, other tafasis don't say that. I haven't said that in this last four or five lectures. Look at the difference here. God assists you with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, do not become weak or languid or feeble or hurt by their, that is the mushrikeen, by their own weaknesses uh, and feebleness and the hurtful things and damage and torment they are causing you because with God you are patient not just by yourself. Okay? Very beautiful understanding. Now, he then quotes a verse from Surah number 16, verse 127. I will explain everything, but I'm giving you the whole sort of translation. Then Ibn Arabi quotes this verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wasbir, wa ma sabruka illa billah, wa la tahzan alayhim. Allah says to the Prophet, and be patient, and your patient is not except by the assistance of Allah. And don't be sad for them, don't grieve for them or be sad about them, and don't distress yourself about what they plan. Right? Now, there are three things happening here. In this understanding of the Prophet's character and choices, okay? Number one, we accept that the Prophet is created with fitra. That's what I said yesterday, okay? We are not saying that the Prophet is different to you and I in the way Allah has created him as such, because then there is a problem about adala of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? But people asked, yeah, but he's a. People are asked after the Majlis here, but the Prophet is a special man. And if we're talking about this, then you're reducing his status. And we have heard from before that, you know, he was created with a special substance. All these things come, okay? But this is how you reconcile this, okay? If you look at it mystically, is that it is God who assists you with the Ruhul Qudus, the Holy Spirit. Now, at this juncture, there is in the Prophet's life, angels, there is in the Prophet's life a Holy Spirit, there is in the Prophet's life the sense of Nur, God's light upon him. We also too have access to these things if it were not for our sh the shayateen that we surround ourselves in. So the difference is, as I've said before and I don't want to repeat, is that the Prophet was able to further his fitra and character through the choices that he made which enabled the Holy Spirit to assist him. That's the first part of this. The second part of this is that God is now giving him advice. Do not become weak and feeble and don't be hurt by what they say. You have a mighty disposition. Now, at this point here, the prophet has a choice to make. And this is a very nuanced point. 
some of your questions or some of the discussions we had after Salah is, comes, I'm not blaming any of you, it's nothing like that. We sometimes come with a presumption that our beloved Prophet cannot behave in another way because he is destined to be Prophet. Okay? He's chosen by Allah. He has to do this. And as I will come to hopefully the end of the lecture, Imam Hussein al Islam had to die because that was his destiny. He couldn't make another choice. There's sometimes that presump presumption operating with our understanding of Rasulullah. But this verse proves otherwise. And there are other verses, but I'm dealing with this tafsir. Wasbir is what? Wasbir means be patient. Now it is a fi'al amr. It is a command by Allah, right? Salli, pray. Okay. But here you have an issue. What type of command is this towards our beloved Prophet? Is it an order that you have to be patient? And if you don't be patient, you are punished. Number two, is it an ethical nasiha? An ethical piece of advice. I am guiding you morally, but you make the choice. Three, is it an act of love by Allah? Because we have discussed this, the notion of Ummi, one of the sisters said that the Prophet was taught by Allah. So is this an act of love by Allah? That Allah loves the Prophet and therefore it's not an instruction, it's a kind of ish, irshadi, it's a kind of guidance through love or ethics, right? And four, not only that, in these, whichever command you select, because they all have different consequences, right? If the, if the Prophet is not patient, see where this is going, by the way. See what is happening to our presumptions and interpretation. If you say that the Prophet is not patient, because this is an order by Allah to do something, then what happens? There is a punishment. There is a sin. Then it affects the isma. You see that? Yeah? Can you see the logical flow here? If we interpret commands by Allah as these black and white orders, as if like from the government, that you have a red traffic light and you must stop at the red traffic light because otherwise you'll get a fine or you'll be stopped by the cops and whatever it is, right? If, you're going, if we are going to interpret commands of God, of God like that, the Quran becomes an extremely rigid book. And then, as, as we saw from the questions and answers, prophets, prophets themselves, become very, very rigid people. Then we get into this issue that, oh, prophet acted differently here. He, he, did he feel anger? As some of you asked, one of the uncles asked, okay, Prophet Yunus, subhanaka, uh, la ilaha illan subhanaka, inni kuntu min al I'm of the unjust. You see that? See where this is all going? I hope I'm being clear here, right? That this patience that you, that if we say that it, if he doesn't behave in this particular way or makes a different choice, then you say, okay, it leads to a sin, it affects his moral standing, it affects his isma, it corrupts Islamic message, and then it affects the whole notion of Nabu and everything collapses. Do you see that? So it becomes an all or nothing approach, right? Have I been clear? Please, please tell me, uh, brothers and uncles. Yes? Okay. However, however, if you, if you say, if you say, especially according to this notion of, of mysticism and ethics, if you say that wasbir, be patient, is essentially an ethical or loving command by Allah, a nurturing command by Allah, a command of training by Allah, look how everything changes, right? If the Prophet in this instance, let's say, is not patient. Okay, I'm just giving an example. Let's say he's not patient. Has he done something wrong here? Look, mashallah, I, okay, you've seen my two young children. Mashallah, you, you are, some of your parents, you have older children, so you can advise me and my wife better. Inshallah, you can tell me what's going to happen in the next 15, 10 years with hormones and I don't know, tell me, inshallah. Um, but so far, from what I understand of parenting, right, you give, you give different orders and instructions to your children and they all carry different weights, right? 
when you really want them to do something, you will mean it and say, stop, you are doing it. You are coming to the masjid. I mean, it's giving an example, right? And I, we, I do say that, we do say that, right? But, but sometimes, sometimes, I'll give an example actually of salah, right? So in training our children to pray salah, sometimes I'm going to say, better come in namaz perso, or, or salah paro, but I won't say it with a lot of anger. I, I, I will say it in a nice way, because I just want to plant the seed in the mind. Pray namaz. But I'm not expecting anything. But mashallah, they do try. You know, I'm not saying that. But my point to you is even, even in terms of our natural fitra, we look at the child's psychology. We look at their circumstances. We look at how tired they are. As I said, we went to downtown today, right? Um, uh, because, uh, like my daughter could rest on the bed, then I said, pray salah, right? But I'm just giving an example. If, if we didn't have chance to rest, Maybe I wouldn't say it. I'm just giving you an example, right? My, and you would know much better than me. My point is, even in, in our natural human life, we give different orders in, in instructions based on what is known in, in philosophy and law as the subject or subject matter, right? The subject of the law. That's what we say, right? We're all subjects of the law, right? So we assess the individual circumstances and then we give the orders accordingly. You see that? Now, if you go by this interpretation here, which I'm, I'm just sharing with you, it's up to you, you can reject it or agree with it, is that wasbir can be regarded as this kind of ethical and loving training given to Rasulullah, where Allah knows he is psychologically disturbed, that even if he was not to be patient in that circumstance, it wouldn't necessarily mean it is a sin. Do you see that? Now, you can say, you can say that it is a kind of, he could have done, you know, Tarkul Awla and all this. He, he left the, the better action, right? This is a common understanding given. That when you, you look at why Adam, alayhi salam, why did he go to the tree, right? And why did he take the fruit when he was a forbidden tree or forbidden fruit, right? Now, a lot of scholars say that it's not a sin. He just left the better option. Or they will use this understanding as well, that this is an ethical training of training of Adam But then the bigger question is, why did Allah put the tree in the first place? Allah knew what he was doing. He wanted the tree to be there. He wanted Adam to go there. He wanted shaitan there. This is all a grand play of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are its actors. All the world's a stage and we are its actors. Or like Shakespeare, right? So my point is, look, Allah did this in his hikmah. Now that, now, uh, why shaitan exists and this is a different series of lectures and now there are some sermons in Naju Balaga and verses of Quran which we need to explore for this so please don't ask me this at the end why does shaitan exist okay but but my point to you is that I'm giving you these scenarios directly from Quran directly from Quran to 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 help us understand that when we are looking at these concepts that you have been asking about isma, about moral choice and ethical choice, we first of all have to look at two things. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is communicating with the Prophet and the Prophet's own circumstances. Salawat. And the second part of this, again to answer your questions, and I will still go deeper inshallah tomorrow and day after into this. The second aspect of this is wasbir. Be patient. So this is an act of Rasulullah. It is a full free will, 100% act and choice of Rasulullah. He has to be patient. He has to make the effort. He doesn't make the effort. There will be another verse or another change in circumstances. So there is two things going on here. His juhud, his striving. And then, وَمَا sabruka. Illa billah. And you will not be patient except by the assistance of Allah. So, some of you asked how, how did the Prophet reach this level? He, the answer is here. The, the effort that he put in was assisted by Allah, which consolidated his patience. There was a lutf by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
because he strived so much to achieve a consistency of patience that then, and going back to yesterday's lecture, it became a malaka. It became a faculty in the Prophet's soul that you couldn't remove it anymore. Right? And I gave the example of alcohol, right? I have not taken a sip of alcohol in my life because, because this was not in my household. I've never done it. Okay, fine. So as I said, and to give a challenging question, maybe I've attained 1% of Isma in that category. Now look at the Prophet. He, if you want to talk about Isma or consistency, maybe a better way to understand Isma, it, you know, Isma comes from Asima Yasimu. Isma basically means uh, a sense of barrier there. Okay, you, when you put a barrier in, uh, against something, a barrier to prevent something. Barrier, prevention, it is that kind of meaning. Okay, so the Prophet actually was prevented or there was a barrier in his soul that he wouldn't become impatient. But it happened out of two, two dimensions. His striving and then the assistance, assistance of Allah, which is also possible in our life. I, I've often told some of the uncles here, I've said, how can I learn from your smiling character? I've said that to some of the uncles here. Because I don't, I don't believe maybe I am, I'm like that, right? So I said, how did you achieve that? I genuinely ask, how did you achieve that? So we all have a certain potential and capability to have a malaka in our soul, which then Allah blesses us with and it remains, remains with us forever. But our task, and this is why the Prophet should be that close role model to us, how do we inculcate and put in us the other malaka, the other faculty, the other habits which we lack in our soul, inshallah. Salawat. Okay. As I said, I'm going to expand further, but this is the, the first aspect in analyzing choice. Now the second aspect, the effects of our choice. Every decision, moral decision that we make is going to have an effect on our habits, on our soul, something that remains with us, a good habit or a bad habit. Not only does something remain in our soul, as I've given you my example when I was younger, and you may have your examples, but two is that it also has effects on the world. Now there is a beautiful verse here, uh, where, uh, uh, Salawat please. Allah says, فَسَتُبْسِرُ وَيُبْسِرُونَ Okay, and soon you will see and they will see. بِأَيِّكُمُ maftun. Which of you is maftun? Maftun means enraptured and uh, when you literally are a madman or maniac. That's, the, I'm giving you a literal translation of maftun. Okay, Allah says, soon you will see, that is the, the prophet will see, and they will see, that is his enemies, which of you is afflicted with this total madness? Okay, now there are two points here where I'm talking about effects of moral choices and how the Prophet saw these choices, okay? First and foremost, we have to appreciate one thing. The Quran is very graphic and very honest in describing prophets, right? So when it uses the word maftun, Maftun is an extremely, uh, very graphic word in describing that someone has lost their senses. Majnoon means crazy. There are similar meanings. But maftun means enraptured. You are enraptured, enamored. And it's as if when you talk to that person, this person is enraptured with something else and has lost their senses. Because the prophet, that's what he was accused of. So, so when, they used to, when people used to talk to the Prophet and the Prophet used to relay verses of the Quran, they used to look at Rasulullah as if, as if he was a madman or maniac enraptured with magic, enraptured with jinns. And that is indeed what some of the Orientalists say, that he came out of the cave of Hira, something overtook him, right? Some supernatural entity or some psychological problem. So th the reason I'm making this point is, and just to give an example is, 
we may try to le lead very good lives, right? We, you know, we, we, we want to be kind to each other in the majlis. I'm not saying we're putting up appearances. I'm not. I'm saying we want to be genuine to each other, but we all know that we will all behave differently in our comfort zone, in our home. Yes, I think we can all be honest about that, right? The way we behave with each other is cordial and smiling. But <laughs> Maybe we got home, we uh, plonk ourselves on the bed, we release emotion and all these things, right? Okay. Now, look at the prophets and how Allah has described the prophets in the Quran. You know, if, if I pass away, right, or maybe this is something that's on your mind, how would we like to be remembered? Right? I mean, yes, people, inshallah, people will remember, remember us of good things. And we don't want to think negative of anybody. But the prophets were so sacrificing even after their death that their biographies are on total display in the Quran. I mean, Prophet Musa salam, accidentally killing someone, Adam salam, going to the tree, poor Prophet Yunus trying so hard, and then leaving his community. You know, if you're the Prophet, you don't really want people to know these things. <laughs> and then after they pass away, there's a book which lists everything, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a lesson here telling us that, look, I've chosen these people with these kind of limitations so that we learn from them, right? And the prophets, even their souls, however Allah keeps them alive, I'm sure they might be thinking, oh, no, I didn't want this to be in this book that is here. Oh, dear. But they are so, mashallah, spiritual that... And, and so loving to Allah, they, they would accept it, right? I'm making this point because maftun is a graphic word describing what the Prophet went through and how he was looked at. So you can see his pain, right? Some, you know, sometimes you don't want people to see your pain. You don't want, to see, uh, you want, pe don't want people to see your weakness. But even the, the way the Quran is describing the Prophet you see all the, the inner weaknesses there in that sense, that, that Allah is bringing out what the Prophet felt for us. Okay, that's the first point I'm making. But the second point is, why does Allah say, soon you will see and they will see? And I'm giving he here the interpretation of Allah Matabatabai, Rahmanullah Halayn Al-Mizan. And I'm quoting to you, he says that, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that moral choices have an effect uh, in this world and the akhirah. Okay? In this world and the akhirah. So when Allah says, look, Prophet, you are being patient at this time, don't worry, you will see the effects in this world and or the akhirah. And, and the enemies will also see the choices they made and which of you is maftur like a madman. Okay, so this is the first point. Moral choices do have effects in this world as well as the akhirah, right? So the Quran very early on is training us to think about long-term thinking of our actions which I humbly think is very difficult to do. I mean, when we are sitting together, it's easy to backbite, right? We're not always thinking. When, um, for example, we're leading our lives, we're not thinking, my action here, what's, what's going to be the effect when I pass away, right? But in this verse and in the tafsir of, of, of uh, Al-Mizan, Alama Tabata by saying, look, this is a lesson for us to have long-term ethical thinking and to try to develop this and we do it a lot by the way we do it for our centers we want to have a nice vision for our centers we do it with planning we want to buy a house okay how long will the house be and okay this is enough for school we do it with everything else what school do i sex education maybe not for our moral deeds right so this is a beautiful lesson that's the second point by Allah now the third point is my own humble notes and I'm trying to come up with an answer. I humbly feel from my readings of, of doing, uh, known as Tafsirul Muqarin, which is comparative Tafsir of about six, seven surahs I've done as much as I can in depth, that there is some kind of concept of karma in the Quran. And I'm not, karma isn't the right word because karma is associated with reincarnation, which we do not, the Quran doesn't believe in. 
which is that our good and bad deeds then lead us to being some kind of having a different existence or we are reborn into an animal or whatever in this life. But when I say karma, just to make us understand, is there is some kind of positive and negative energy and natural consequence of our deeds that does come back to us, whether in this life or the next. And that is absolutely clear in these early verses. Because in these verses, the enemies of the Prophet did see what happened to them. I'll give you a simple example. Walid ibn Mughira. Walid ibn Mughira, uh, and he's referenced in Surah Al-Alaq, was one of the greatest enemies of our beloved Prophet. One of the greatest. Okay? He was a wealthy and notable man in Makkah. His sons, right? His sons, he had several sons, and I think a couple of daughters, if I'm not mistaken, they were amongst the notables of Makkah. He vehemently stopped the Prophet preaching, used to go behind him, curse him. Even there are reports of that when the Prophet used to go uh, to the Kaaba, that sort of stepping on his forehead or physically trying to hit him. We have a lot of reports like that of how the Prophet was physically and verbally abused by this person. And towards the end of his life, he had lost his wealth and several of his children became Muslim. Okay? And I'm giving you this example because this happened in the Prophet's own lifetime. Okay? Even if you want to talk about the, the fat or the victory of Makkah, that happened in the Prophet's lifetime. That when he returned to Makkah, okay, Sutul Fat, this happened in the Prophet's lifetime. Abu Sufyan lost power. Okay? There are instances where the enemies of the Prophet did not see what actually happened to their circumstances that they became maftun. They lost their senses. How could my children become Muslim? How could I lose my wealth? How could I lose my tribal standing? They simply couldn't foresee it. And that was, how did that happen? Because the Prophet was patient and allowed people's consciences to grow closer to Islam. So, it appears we do have a concept of a positive act yielding a positive outcome and a negative act yielding a negative outcome. Now, whether you want to say what goes around, comes around, however you want to put it, I want to, we want to try to come up with some terminology. Maybe you have seen it in your own life. You, you, you do something good for someone and you get it back. Would you agree? I, I don't know. You, sometimes it's immediate, sometimes it's later. And you, you, before, you don't even realize it sometimes, right? So it, it shows that the Quran is training us to see that there is a result in our deeds. Now, one thing which I haven't come to conclusion with is if we do something bad, where do we see the punishment? And this is something I'm still trying to understand, right? So if I do a bad thing today and nobody knows about it, where is the punishment? Am I punishing myself? Okay, yes, I'm corrupting my soul. Am I doing something to you? No, I'm not. Three, will Allah punish me in the akhirah? Okay, yes or possibly. But four is if in my lifetime I, I, I was not held accountable, then surely in the akhirah I should be held accountable. Now Allah says in the Quran, I am giving a respite to the enemies or prophet so, so, fasbir, be patient. I'm giving respite. So what, you know, trying to understand punishment here, it is, this is one understanding of these verses. It is possible that maybe we are punished in this life and also punished in the akhirah, or we are absolutely punished in this life and not punished in the akhirah. Now, I know this is, this is very direct, but I, I'm, I'm just thinking out aloud with you because I'm trying to find an answer myself is when we talk about illness in the world, when we talk about death, when we talk about natural disasters, when we talk about our own actions and then nobody holds us accountable, we might see somebody corrupt in the community, corrupt in society. So how, how is he getting away with this? And people are still respecting that person or whatever it is, right? How many, so when is, does that punishment occur? So my small conclusion so far is that it is within the divine providence or will 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses certain areas where either there is a reward and punishment that we realize in our life or the akhirah, but we cannot detect it immediately. Salawat. I want to give a specific example from Karbala, actually. This is actually um, in response to Marwan ibn al-Hakam, and it is quoted in the Maktal of Kharizmi. And everything that I have said about destiny, about choice, about the effects of good and bad choices, I humbly believe is contained in this response to Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Okay, Al Hussein ibn Ali al Islam says the following. He says, "Walaqad sami'atu jaddi Rasulillah yaqulu al khilafatu muharramatun ala Ali Abi Sufyan fa idha ra'aytum Muawiya ala minbari fabqiru batana wa qad ra'ahu ahl al Madina ala al minbar." فَلَمْ يَبْقِرُوا فَابْتِلَاهُمُ اللَّهُ بِيَزِيدِ الْفَاسِقِ He says uh, that um, the, the first few lines, is, which I didn't read out for sake of time, he's, he quotes, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Then he says, the world of Islam, the world of Islam will disappear. Look at this, look at this statement, which is why I began with the Quran and now al Hussein. The world of Islam will disappear as soon as the Ummah, the total Ummah, is afflicted with such a supporter like Yazid. And I have heard from my grandfather, the Messenger of Allah, who used to say, the Khilafah is forbidden for the descendants of Abi Sufyan. Okay. So when you notice Muawiyah uh, on my member, on my pulpit, tear his abdomen. Okay, literally tear his ab you know, take out his stomach or tear out his abdomen, right? But the inhabitants of Medina have noticed him on the member. They saw Muawiyah, okay? But they never killed him, okay? In consequence, Allah afflicted them with Yazid, the Fasik, in, in brackets, who is worse than Muawiyah. Okay? It reveals a lot to us. I have five minutes left. It reveals a lot to us about Karbala. And then I'll conclude. Number one, that Karbala occurred essentially not just purely because of divine destiny. As we have said, Prophet was just destined to be prophet regardless of his choice. No, because we showed from the Quran that he had choice. But here in this sense of Karbala, Karbala occurred from the previous choices of the previous generation which led to the events of Karbala and the ascension of Yazid on the pulpit. This is not something that happened automatically. It happened over a period of years. Okay. Then number two is, the Ummah felt the affliction when Yazid came, okay, because they didn't act, which is their free choice. And then three, the world of Islam disappeared. So now, going back to my first point, if we don't really have a truly Muslim country in the world, whose fault is it? That's the first one. If two Muslim asylum seekers are escaping their own Muslim countries, whose fault is it? We often want to blame the West for everything sometimes. Western media, Western conspiracy, yeah, okay, no problem. Yes, colonialism, empire, wars, 100% agreed. But we also have a hand in this. We also have a choice here, right? And three, not only that, whatever choices we are making now for our community and for our society, is going to affect the next generations. So then it also means we have a moral responsibility, not just to ourselves, but inshallah for the future. Salawat.
ഇന്ന ലില്ലാഹി വ ഇന്ന ഇലൈഹി റാജിഉ മൈ ഡിയർ ബ്രദേഴ്സ് ആൻഡ് സിസ്റ്റേഴ്സ് ടുണൈറ്റ് വി ഗോ ടു ദി ഹാർട്ട് ഓഫ് സൈനബ് ബിൻ തഅലി സലാമു അല്ലാഹി സലാമു അല്ലാഹി അലൈഹ ദ ബിലവേഡ് ഡോട്ടർ ഓഫ് അലി the granddaughter of rasulullah and of course the daughter of our beloved fatima salamu alaihi alaiha zainab was more than just a woman or a companion or sister of hussein in karbala she was like another soldier she was that person and if ever people have visited karbala inshallah we all uh, may allah help us pay respects to our imams that she was in the middle of the camp not in the front of the of the camp in the middle of the camp keeping the morale of the camp and nursing imam sajad alayhi salam but at that point as some reports say as some reports say that she had two sons on and muhammad some reports say that one of the son had another mother in tariqa tabri and others doesn't matter the point is there were children there the point is that we know that zainab had kin there now for a mother to lose children i can, i'm a father i cannot say but the mothers here the mothers will say more more than i can and in fact they should do the maktab for a mother to allow children to go into the battle to lose their children i cannot speak and i don't i cannot find the words to say that but i can say that zainab bint ali was a true mother for allowing the children to make a choice that they understood in order to help their uncle hussein ibn ali alayhi salam that those small children when they went into the battlefield and the enemies came and did not care about their age or their standing that when they came armor barely fitting them they were still martyred and killed by the enemy in fact in ziyarat nahiya it is reported that we have this line السلام على دماء السائلات السلام على دماء السائلات here in this ziyara we do not give just salams to the names we don't say assalamu ala al husain wa aulad al husain wa ashab al husain it means peace be upon the flowing blood it means that the blood that flowed from the children from the companions from the family that filled the desert that that blood itself is something worthy to be respected so you can imagine that even if children like ali al asgar abdullah the infant and others that if they are martyred doesn't matter the size of their body doesn't matter their strength what matters is the blood and time and sacrifice they gave for abba abdullah and tell me oh dear mothers how can mothers endure that this is the greatness of zainab bint ali islam inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun oh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask you to please give us a strength to make the right moral choices in our lives for ourselves and for our beloved children all that we ask you to please help us learn from the quran and from karbala to help us fight oppression all that may grant shafa to the ill and may you hasten the reappearance of our dear 12th imam imam muhammad al mahdi ajallahu farja ربنا ربنا لا تجعلنا مع قوم الظالمين صوت الفاتحه امم اوكي ما دي اوكي سوري 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 س
Allah have to send lots of messengers to negotiate with different people to behave, to believe in him and then them getting harmed. Obviously, Allah wasn't trying to force people, but maybe he was trying to, but maybe he was trying to because he sent 124,000 prophets and 12 imams, one after the other. Okay, shukran. Thank you, my daughter. Um, so just to clarify, Mariam, your question is why why did God send all these prophets? Okay. Uh, is it that you wanted, why don't these people follow Allah? Or, or is it through the prophets he was trying to force people? So No, so, yes. no, so um, why did Allah mm -hmm. have to um, send lots of messengers? Yes. To make them believe in him, why couldn't he just do a miracle or put oh, it in I their see. Hands, uh, like when he made okay, them. why does do a miracle? Okay, so uh, the, 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 okay, so I think the question is there recorded probably, or shall I repeat it? Re recorded. Okay, so it, it's a philosophical question. It's about to let me answer in this because for to lower the language is number one is God. God can force you to do something. Yes, He can force you. Would you appreciate? That action, if you force, if I, if I force you all the time, right, uh, to do homework and to pray, which yes, I have to put the pressure, <laughs> but, but, but I hopefully I am trying. We are trying to guide you so you appreciate that this is good for in the long run. Yes, would you agree? Okay. So to answer your first part, prophet, I mean Allah is doing the same thing. He's sending these prophets to give them a nudge in the right direction. He's not forcing a nudge in the right direction. Number two, if he did a miracle and all of us believes, what's the point? Because he created human beings with free will, Maryam, yes? Angels are the ones that follow Allah and obey Allah. They are not given that free will, you understand? So if you want the miracle, we're going to be angels. But he didn't want that for you and me. He wanted us to be humans experiencing the pleasures and pains of life. Assalamu alaikum, mm -hmm. brother Imran. Sure, how are you? Oh, you really appreciate the lecture today. So, um, uh, my question to you is you mentioned uh, in the first lecture that there were three um, hukams from Allah. The first one being a command that was the consequences was a punishment. Yes. And the second one being a nasiya, correct? Mm -hmm. and, then yeah. nice. and the third one was love. Right? Yeah, love. So, yeah. Okay, so my question to you is how, like, let's say if I'm reciting the Quran, how would I be able to distinguish grammatically mm -hmm. from what yes. you know of yes. between those three uh, approaches that Allah uh, gives? Like, mm -hmm. for example, in Surah Hud, it says, uh, So already mm -hmm. there is mm -hmm. um, a, a, a threat of a punishment in that. Yes, right? yes, yes. But in the more kind of subtle verses, how would you be able to distinguish? from those three different yes. uh, commands from Allah. Now, mashallah, it's a very good question. A um, couple, of, couple of ways, although by no means these are exhaustive, right? One is from the context and sabab al nuzul Now, I, of course, I know, mashallah, you read Quran, but, but sometimes looking at the verses before and after and the whole surah as a whole. So sometimes you can't detect it just from the verse itself. Yeah, it's, it's the whole context, the karina. The karina, the, the reason of revelation, which kind of gives you, like, I'll give the, the example I gave a few nights ago of, of, of Surah Al Muzammil, right? Kummi layla illa kalila, right? Stand in the prayer except at night. And my humble view is this, this is, a, this is a, a command out of love and training, a spiritual command. It's not like a command that if he, does it, if he doesn't do it, it's a sin and then it, it affects the isma. It can't be read like that. The whole 20 verses is about the training of the Prophet. But you only get that when you read everything together. So this is one way. The other way is, depending on what tafsir that you read, like Al-Mizan, or depending on Arabic or English, Majmal Bayan, at the start there is a sabab nuzul there, which summarizes that the reason of revelation. Now that reason is very important because it tells us, like in Surah Al-Muzammil, that the Prophet was going through some personal tur tur turmoil. Now in other cases, it might not be that Allah is, is directly telling the Prophet, you, you, kind of, you have to act in this way. And if you don't act in this way, then you're going to bring about turmoil on yourself or the community, right? So that's another. And three, the very good example you gave is about azab, okay, the, the punishment, right? So, so there, if, if verses have this kind of there, you can see, and that's why I ended the lecture with this notion of punishment, that, that however 
whether we like it or not, there is punishment in the Quran, right? We have to deal with it. So that punishment means it could be something immediate or something later on. And I think it's a very important point because the Prophet, if he doesn't do something, that means maybe the punishment could occur and then you can interpret the fi'al amr as this direct instructive command. You see that? You get it? But when you say, kum mil layla illa qalila, stand in the night except a little, all right, what's the punishment? You see? Yes, yeah, so there's some indications there, inshallah. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, alaikum um, you brought up this very interesting. Um, you spoke about how. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sort of losing my train of thought here, but if we don't take action at a particular time, mm -hmm. something more devastating happens. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, I forget, was it Muavia? Yes. Uh, was then superseded by Yazid, yes. many times worse. Are we unwittingly perpetrating that currently when we. Flock to Mecca, mm -hmm. and we flock to the Ziyarat, mm -hmm. which we love these sacred spaces, mm -hmm. and we completely ignore the human rights abuses that are happening, mm -hmm. and the fact that we have power mm -hmm. to put pressure on these governments mm -hmm. by abstaining for mm -hmm. a period of time. Mm -hmm. I'm. This is this is just something that's really troubled me mm -hmm. a lot because well, so much has happened in recent mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. um, and there was even the journalist who was killed uh, in Turkey. And his, his, his body was never found and his, his fiance, as you know, was uh, mm -hmm. uh, waiting for him to come and he never yes. came. Meanwhile, what I've heard, and I just asked people, because I'm struggling with this, I've, I've not come to a conclusion mm -hmm. about this myself, is, no, this is my wajibat. But if the Prophet was here today, mm -hmm. would he really want us not to put pressure mm -hmm. on, on governments just because their graves are there? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? No, shukran. Thank you very much. Uh, Mashal, a very good question. It's recorded, right? So I don't have to repeat. Okay. Very good question. What is our duty today um, in, sort of, in sort of stopping from something getting worse? And you gave the example of Ziyarat. Yeah, more responsibility. I, I'm trying to find an example from Islamic history, actually. I, one example has come, come to my mind, actually. When Imam al-Islam became fourth caliph, right? In his very first sermon, very first sermon, he quoted um, Suratul, Suratul Hujurat, that is chapter 49, verse 13. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnaakum il dhakarim al-untha, right? Oh, human, uh, mankind, we've created male and female and made you nations and tribes. Indeed, the most noblest of you is the one who's most God conscious. Okay, that one. Now, just to, to directly answer your question, is that he put a moral responsibility on, on his community, on the Muhajir and the Ansar. Now, the Muhajir were the ones that fled, uh, fled uh, Mecca, persecution, and Ansar, uh, the, the people in Medina welcoming them or helping the Prophet, right? Now, this is, I find this very interesting because you made a very good point about us today, like as Shia Muslims or as Muslims going for Ziyarat, right? Imam Ali did not care for the status of these Muslims, and I think is extremely powerful. At that time, the Muhajir and the Ansar said, we are the Muhajir and the Ansar. We have a right in this community to be treated in a particular way, and we do not owe certain duties to other classes and groups. Right? <laughs> Imam Ali quoted this 4913. Okay? And when he quoted, saying, no, the meaning of this verse is I'm going to judge you on the basis of who is most noblest of you, not on the basis of your sectarian or group leaning or what you have so-called achieved in the past. So Imam Ali was very much cognizant of active duties in society and was not comfortable with a muhajir saying, I am a muhajir, my duty is only now to behave as a muhajir, and not, for example, to now look after this or, uh, for example, you know, the, the Muhajir and Sa didn't want money just to, from Baytul Mal to go to certain non-Arabs in society. They didn't want that. And you know what Imam Ali did? If I'm correct, uh, it's, this is in the Shah of Naju Balaga and the book by Ray, Shah, Ray Shahri. Muhammad Ray Shahri has a book on Imam Ali and the Khilaf, which translated in English, you can read it. Just to give you the source, 
if I'm correct, he gave three dinars to each person in front of him. Muhajir, Ansar, non-Arab, slave, everybody. And some of these groups didn't like it. So to answer your question, yes, we do have a duty to stop corruption or to give to people or to stop that injustice from happening despite our status or leaning. Um, I can add more, but I just wanted to give you a reference. Uh, I think that more can be said, but I want to keep to time, yeah? Is that okay? Yes, okay. I'm gonna take one more question from Elisa before going back. <laughs> Very nice lecture, thank you. My understanding is that if I commit any sin and I ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will forgive. I'm told that he will forgive any kind of sins except shirk. Yes. If you ask from anybody else except Allah uh -huh. for help, um, then he won't forgive you. Yes. It's in the Surah Fatiha, the Yakana, the Yakana saying. And yet, how come we, I've heard many munajats and kasidas, we're asking directly from imams. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of shirk? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a, big, shukran, it's a big question. <laughs> how, how many minutes till salah? <laughs> One. So, so let, let me give a two-minute answer. I, just to honor the question at least, right? Um, uh, yes, if you are asking directly without reference to Allah, it is 100% shirk. If one believes that the actual source of risk is coming from the Imams, yes, 100% shirk. Two, depending on your notion of wasila and tawassul, okay, uh, obviously people interpret this differently. Saying that, for example, that I am taking uh, the Imam's name simply as a means to gain nearness to Allah, but I'm asking Allah himself. Now that's, yeah, yeah, but I, yes, I'm just being specific, right? But because you asked, if you ask directly for the Imam to give the short answer, yes, if it is without reference to Allah. If it is without reference to Allah, yes. Now, there are more layers to that, and I can't explore that because of Salah time. But if there is no notion of Allah, or there is, a, there is some level of divinity given to Imam, yes, it is shirk. Yes, 100%. Yes. But there are more layers, inshallah. Okay.